This is 8.1.4. We're going to be looking at nuclear stability and different decay curves. So, first of all, we've been given a graph, which is an NZ graph. Um, the Z, which is a proton number, has already been labeled on this graph. And what we want to do first, we want to label the neutron number, which is N. So we're going to start by labeling these as 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, and 120. Before we can draw a stability line, we're first going to draw a, a line, which is n equals to z. So I'm going to change to a dotted line. We're going to use a different color for this. So let's do blue. And just from the axes here, we're going to draw a line that represents n equals to z. So that's that line over there. And we'll just label this line as n is equal to z. Next, we're going to switch back to uh, our usual pen color. So in this case, I'm using black. And when doing the NZ graphs, there's a few numbers you need to consider. So in the beginning, the stability line follows n equals to z. So for lighter elements, if you think of, for example, helium, if you think of uh, lithium, the lighter elements, the proton and neutron numbers are approximately the same. So helium, for example, is two protons, two neutrons, it's the same. For helium, it's three protons and four neutrons. So almost the same number, not quite, but almost the same. So what we do is we go to 2020 and we make a little mark there. Next, we go to 40 and we go all the way up to 4050 and we make a little mark just underneath 4050. So around about there. Then we go up to 6080 and 6080, we go just slightly below 80, we make a mark there. And then we go to 80, and we go all the way up to 120. Then we go slightly below, and we make a mark there. So our stability line looks something like this. Now I'm going to change colors again to red, and we're going to draw two other lines. So one red line is going to follow, almost follow, the line of stability at the start, but it's going to go slightly higher. So we're going to start to deviate it just after the 2020. Then we draw another red line, and this one's going to be slightly below. Something like that. And then we can label our different graphs. So this black line here, these are the most stable nuclei. Now, not all nuclei that exist actually lie on this line. Some of them deviate from this line, and they veer towards either of the red lines. So some nuclei, some nuclei exist in a region on either side of this line and things that exist on either side of this line 
they're going to do some form of a decay to try to get back to that line. So these will undergo beta minus or beta plus to get closer to this line. So I'll just switch back to red. Now, the red line on the left tends to have more neutrons than it has protons, a lot more. So these are called, well compared to the stability line anyway, so these are called neutron rich, so they are beta minus emitters. So these are beta minus emitters because they are neutron rich. On this side, we've got our beta plus emitters because they are proton rich. Again, in comparison to the stability line. At the top here, you've got the very heavy elements and these are your alpha emitters. because they're heavy. Now, what I want to do next is, uh, before we move on to the next sheet, I want to draw another grid to explain exactly what different decays do in terms of movement on this graph. So if you find some space, what we'll do is we'll just draw a grid. And we're going to do this as a 6 by 6 grid. So that should make it easy to do any of the decays. OK. In the center of this 6 by 6 grid, we're going to do our starting positions. So this here is our starting position. We'll put Z on the x-axis and N on the y-axis. And then we'll think about the different decays that we can have. So if we start with beta plus decay. Beta plus decay happens when a proton turns itself into a neutron and emits a positron and a neutrino. If a proton turns into a neutron, then the proton number has gone down by one and the neutron number has gone up by one. So we're going to move one to the left on the Z axis and then one up. I'll just do that again with the proper arrow. So that there is beta plus decay. Then we can have beta minus decay. For beta minus decay, a neutron decays into a proton and emits, emits a beta minus. So the neutron number goes down by one and the proton number increases by one. So that will be another diagonal going down this way. 
So that is beta minus decay. And then finally, we've got alpha. Alpha gets rid of two protons and two neutrons. So both the proton number and the neutron number will go down for alpha decay. So we end up with this, which is alpha decay. And we'll just make a note of these now. So beta plus lose one neutron, sorry, lose one proton, gain one neutron. For beta minus, we lose one neutron and we gain one proton. And for alpha, we lose two protons and two neutrons. And then finally, if we have electron capture, electron capture results in the same as beta plus decay, except for we don't have a beta plus, but we move in the same direction. So if there's electron capture, your neutron number goes up by one, and your proton number decreases by one. So electron capture is the same as beta plus, but without emission of beta plus. Okay, we'll move on to the next sheet. So, on this sheet, we want a few different things drawn. We want beta minus emission drawn, labeled as A neutron emission labeled as B, and electron capture labeled as C. So if we do our arrows, so again, beta minus emission, your proton number goes up by one, your neutron number decreases by one. So this is labeled A. I'll put beta minus in brackets. Your neutron emission doesn't change your proton number at all, but it decreases your neutron by one. So this is labeled as B, neutron emission. And then finally, it's electron capture. And before we do the electron capture, we'll just write down how that works. So you've got AZX plus an electron, which is uh, 0 minus 1, turns into, and doing that will change the element to something else. So we'll call that Y, A, Z minus 1, plus a neutrino. So doing that brings our proton number by, down by 1, but increases our neutron number. So that the total, n plus z, still remains the same value, a. And this will be labeled as c. And I'll write down here, electron capture.
Now we move on to our next sheet. And it says here that you've got uh, an unstable isotope of lead which has to decay in three stages through alpha and beta emissions uh, to a different lead nuclide, which is 20682 lead. The position of these lead nucleides on a grid of neutron number n and against proton number z is shown in the grid below. On the grid, draw three arrows to represent one possible decay route. Label each arrow with the decay taking place. In this situation, there's actually multiple decay routes you can take, so I'm going to show you the three possible ways to do it. So for this, I'm going to use the dotted arrows. So one way of doing it is we can start with an alpha decay. So there's alpha, followed up with two beta decays. So one beta decay there followed by another beta decay. So that's beta minus beta minus. Next possible way, and I'll change the color to show that it's a different path, is we can start with two beta plus decays so there's one, there's another. So that's our beta plus, beta plus. Sorry, these are beta minuses, apologies. Beta minus, beta minus. And then finally we can have one alpha. That will bring it there. And then we can do one other route, which is that we do the first beta minus as we did previously. We just change the color here. So we can do that beta as we did previously. But then we can do an alpha and then finally finish with a beta. So in this situation we've got a beta minus, then an alpha, then another beta minus. And we can just label these as path 1, which is alpha, beta minus, beta minus. Then we got path two, which is beta minus, beta minus, then alpha. And then we've got path three, which is beta minus, then alpha, and then beta minus again. Now, we can start a new page on lined paper. So far, we've talked about the decays of alpha and beta, both types of beta, but we haven't talked about gamma. So next, we'll do gamma radiation. So gamma radiation does not change a nucleus into a different element like the others did. Instead, gamma radiation is emitted when an excited nucleus de-excites.
just like what happens with excited electrons. But instead of emitting a photon with small amounts of energy, it emits photons with extremely large amounts of energy, which is a gamma photon. So a nucleus in an excited state de-excites and emits gamma radiation. Now, this doesn't have to be instantly. It can happen over some time. So now the question is, well, how do these nuclei become excited? Because gamma has an extremely huge amount of energy. So how are we going to get one of these nuclei to become excited to that level? So that normally happens when there's an initial decay, which leads from one parent radionuclide to another daughter radionuclide, who happens to be in an excited state from the first decay. So we start with a parent Now the parent radionuclide usually decays with alpha or beta So alpha or beta decay That leads to the daughter which is either completely unstable or metastable. If it's completely unstable, then that nuclei or nucleus will decay further by alpha or beta. But if it's metastable, it means that it's reached an isotope where it's stable, however has the excess energy, which means that its nucleus, the nucleus right now, is in an excited state. So if something is metastable, it's in an excited state. The nucleus, that is. So what happens next is that it emits a gamma photon. It doesn't just have to be one, it can be multiple. So or multiple gamma photons. So it depends on its energy levels, right? And how it reaches the ground state. And then it becomes stable. Okay, start a new page. Now finally we're going to talk about radio tracers and producing um, one example of them. So radio tracers are used in hospitals where you want to scan a patient's body using gamma photons. Now to do this, they need to ingest or be injected with some radioactive material that emits gamma. Several problems here. Number one, we know that radiation is harmful to living things. But sometimes we still need to use them. So we want to do this scan, but we also want to limit the exposure to radiation 
so that the patient doesn't then end up with other health issues in the process. Which basically means we want just enough radiation to do the scan. We don't want any lingering radiation afterwards, so we don't want it to remain in the, in the patient's body for a long period of time. That way it increases the risks. And if we are only using gamma to scan the patient, we don't want any alpha or beta being emitted by these materials. So for this we use a process called elution and some equipment called a MOTEC generator. So this is the 99 MTC generator, which is also called the MOTEC generator. So we start with an isotope of molybdenum called molybdenum-99. Molybdenum-99 is a beta-minus emitter. It has a half-life of about 66 hours, I believe. Now, molybdenum-99, when it decays, it decays into technetium-99M. And technetium-99M is metastable. It decays by emitting gamma, and then it turns into technetium-99 without the M. So it's no longer metastable, it's stable. Technetium-99 has a half-life of about 2,500 years or hours, I'd have to look it up, but it's a very long time. So it's basically stable. Now the problem is, if we have a lump of molybdenum decaying into technetium 99M, well we can't inject that right away, because then the patient will have molybdenum, which is a beta emitter, also in their bodies, with a long half-life. Technetium 99M has a very short half-life of only six hours. So we have to use a process called elution to separate them. So we have a cylinder which has got molybdenum inside it. So this is molybdenum 99. As the molybdenum decays, it produces technetium-99. MO-99 decays gradually via beta-minus, producing technetium-99M, which is metastable. and emits gamma. Molybdenum-99 is a beta emitter with T a half equal to 66 hours. Whereas technetium-99M has T a half equal to six hours. So technetium will decay very quickly in a patient's body and it won't linger, causing unnecessary amounts of radiation to be absorbed. So what we do is we've got another container that's got saline in it. Saline just means salt water. Now, technetium is soluble in saline. Molybdenum is not. So if we pump saline through this MOTEC generator, any technetium that's been produced will dissolve in that saline solution, but molybdenum will not dissolve in that solution. And then we basically just collect the saline solution on the other end. 
which has got technetium 99M, which is TC99M solution. And then that solution is what will be injected into the patient's body. While they're doing this extraction, they call it milking the cow because they do so periodically. In the beginning, if we start the clock, we've got lots of molybdenum and the activity of molybdenum starts at a maximum level and it decays gradually. As it's decaying, however, a secondary activity begins to appear, which is a gamma activity. And that gamma activity increases as more technetium 99M is produced. Every few hours, when that technetium 99M has reached its maximum activity, then through elution they'll extract it and then wait a few more hours to allow more of that to, to be created and then extract it again. So the graph for that looks like this. So, first I'm going to draw the decay curve for molybdenum. Now, because it's got a long half-life, if we're looking at it in a short perspective, so like over a day or two, the decay curve for molybdenum is going to look like a very slow straight line. So this is molybdenum 99. As that starts to decay, though, at the same time, technetium begins to be produced. When it's reached a maximum value through elution, we extract the technetium. So the activity due to technetium in the Motec generator falls to zero because we've extracted all the technetium. Then, after some time, that technetium is being produced again. When it reaches another maximum, we get rid of it through elution. And then again. So this is where we do elution to extract TC99M. And this black solid line here is technetium 99M. So you can see here that after doing this a few times, we have basically don't get as much out of it anymore. So you can't carry on using it for an extremely long time. So then the question is, well, why don't they just deliver technetium straight to the hospital? Why do they have to do this process at the hospital? Well, first of all, technetium has a very short half-life. So when it's produced, you've only got some hours to use it before it's decayed by a half-life. So if it's six hours, one half-life would have gone. In 12 hours, two half-lives would have gone. In 24 hours, that's four half-lives already done. So there's basically nothing left at that point. Molybdenum, however, has got a half-life of 66 hours. So it could be delivered a couple of days in advance or a week in advance and kept on the shelves in stock at the hospital. So molybdenum 99 has a strong, has a long shelf life. So can be stored in advance of patient visit. Of patient you don't want molybdenum in the patient as well.
you don't want Mo 99 in patient because number one, it's got long half-life, which means increased exposure. Number two, it emits beta minus. So first of all, it's not beta minus is not being used for this scan, and also beta minus is more ionizing than the gamma radiation. Then for technetium, it's going to be produced on the day of the patient's visit. Produced on the day of visit. It's got a short half-life, so it doesn't stay in the patient for long. Now, for the actual scan, we can't use a GM tube because a GM tube counts the amount of radiation rather than giving us an energy. Now, if you are scanning a patient's body, even gamma, by some small amounts, will have a different amount of energy penetrating the body depending on where it's located and what it's gone through. So when you're scanning the patient, you want to see the differences in energy that's being received from different parts in order to build an image. So a GM tube is not good for this. We use something else called a scintillation counter. So GM tube is not good for alpha, not good for gamma. because it shows a number or number of counts. Not energy. We want to see the actual intensity, so we need to know the energy. And that's going to be enough information to build an image. So to measure gamma energy, use a scintillation counter instead. And that's the end of 8.1.4.